The Lincoln-Douglas debates, also known as the Great Debates of 1858, were a series of seven debates between Abraham Lincoln, the Republican candidate for the United States Senate from Illinois, and incumbent Senator Stephen Douglas, the Democratic Party candidate. At the time, U.S. Senators were elected by state legislatures, thus Lincoln and Douglas were trying for their respective parties to win control of the Illinois General Assembly. The debates previewed the issues that Lincoln would face in the aftermath of his victory in the 1860 presidential election. Although Illinois was a free state, the main issue discussed in all seven debates was slavery in the United States. In agreeing to the official debates, Lincoln and Douglas decided to hold one debate in each of the nine congressional districts in Illinois. Because both had already spoken in two—Springfield and Chicago—within a day of each other, they decided that their joint appearances would be held in the remaining seven districts. The debates were held in seven towns in the state of Illinois. Ottawa on August 21 Freeport on August 27 Jonesboro on September 15 Charleston on September 18 Galesburg on October 7 Quincy on October 13 Alton on October 15 The debates in Freeport, Quincy, and Alton drew especially large numbers of people from neighboring states, as the issue of slavery was of monumental importance to citizens across the nation. Newspaper coverages of the debates were intense. Major papers from Chicago sent stenographers to create complete texts of each debate, which newspapers across the United States reprinted in full, with some partisan edits. Newspapers that supported Douglas edited his speeches to remove any errors made by the stenographers and to correct grammatical errors, while they left Lincoln's speeches in the rough form in which they had been transcribed. In the same way, pro-Lincoln papers edited Lincoln's speeches, but left the Douglas texts as reported. After winning a plurality of the voters but losing in the legislature, Lincoln edited the texts of all the debates and had them published in a book. The widespread coverage of the original debates and the subsequent popularity of the book led eventually to Lincoln's nomination for President of the United States by the 1860 Republican National Convention in Chicago. The format for each debate was, one candidate spoke for 60 minutes, then the other candidate spoke for 90 minutes, and then the first candidate was allowed a 30-minute rejoinder. The candidates alternated speaking first. As the incumbent, Douglas spoke first in four of the debates. Topic. Background Stephen Douglas was first elected to the United States Senate in 1846. In 1858, he was seeking re-election for a third term. During his time in the Senate, the issue of slavery was raised several times, particularly with respect to the Compromise of 1850. As chairman of the Committee on Territories, Douglas argued for an approach to slavery termed popular sovereignty. Electorates at a local level would vote whether to adopt or reject a state constitution which prohibited slavery. Decisions about whether slavery was permitted or prohibited within certain states and territories had been made previously at a federal level. Douglas was successful with passage of the Kansas Nebraska Act in 1854. Abraham Lincoln, like Douglas, had also been elected to Congress in 1846. He served one two-year term in the House of Representatives. During his time in the House, Lincoln disagreed with Douglas and supported the Wilmot Proviso, which sought to ban slavery in new territory. Lincoln returned to politics in the 1850s to oppose the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and help develop the new Republican Party. Before the debates, Lincoln said that Douglas was encouraging his fears of amalgamation of the races with enough success to drive thousands of people away from the Republican Party. Douglas tried to convince, especially the Democrats, that Lincoln was an abolitionist for saying that the American Declaration of Independence did apply to blacks as well as whites. Lincoln called a self-evident truth, the electric cord that links the hearts of patriotic and liberty-loving men together. Of different ethnic backgrounds, Lincoln argued in his House Divided speech that Douglas was part of a conspiracy to nationalize slavery. Lincoln said that ending the Missouri Compromise ban on slavery in Kansas and Nebraska was the first step in this direction, and that the Dred Scott decision was another step in the direction of spreading slavery into northern territories. Lincoln expressed the fear that the next Dred Scott decision would make Illinois a slave state. Both Lincoln and Douglas had opposition. 
Although Lincoln was a former Whig, the prominent former Whig judge Theophilus Lyle Dickey said that Lincoln was too closely tied to the abolitionists, and supported Douglas. But Democratic President James Buchanan opposed Douglas for defeating the Lecompton Constitution, which would have made Kansas a slave state, and set up a rival National Democratic Party that drew votes away from him. The debates The main theme of the Lincoln-Douglas debates was slavery, particularly the issue of slavery's expansion into the territories. It was Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska Act that repealed the Missouri Compromise's ban on slavery in the territories of Kansas and Nebraska, and replaced it with the doctrine of popular sovereignty, which meant that the people of a territory could decide for themselves whether to allow slavery. Lincoln said that popular sovereignty would nationalize and perpetuate slavery. Douglas argued that both Whigs and Democrats believed in popular sovereignty and that the Compromise of 1850 was an example of this. Lincoln said that the national policy was to limit the spread of slavery, and mentioned both at Jonesboro and later in his Cooper Union Address the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which banned slavery from a large part of the modern day Midwest. As an example of this policy, the Compromise of 1850 allowed the territories of Utah and New Mexico to decide for or against slavery, but it also allowed the admission of California as a free state, reduced the size of the slave state of Texas by adjusting the boundary, and ended the slave trade. But not slavery itself in the District of Columbia. In return, the South got a stronger fugitive slave law than the version mentioned in the Constitution. Whereas Douglas said that the Compromise of 1850 replaced the Missouri Compromise ban on slavery in the Louisiana Purchase Territory north and west of the state of Missouri, Lincoln said that this was false, and that popular sovereignty and the Dred Scott decision were a departure from the policies of the past that would nationalize slavery. There were partisan remarks, such as Douglas's accusations that members of the Black Republican Party, such as Lincoln, were abolitionists. Douglas cited as proof Lincoln's House divided speech in which he said, I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. As Douglas said, audience response in parentheses, Uniformity in the local laws and institutions of the different states is neither possible or desirable. If uniformity had been adopted when the government was established, it must inevitably have been the uniformity of slavery everywhere, or else the uniformity of Negro citizenship and Negro equality everywhere. I ask you, are you in favor of conferring upon the Negro the rights and privileges of citizenship? No, no. Do you desire to strike out of our state constitution that clause which keeps slaves and free Negroes out of the state, and allow the free Negroes to flow in? Never. And cover your prairies with black settlements? Do you desire to turn this beautiful state into a free Negro colony? No, no. In order that when Missouri abolishes slavery she can send 100,000 emancipated slaves into Illinois, to become citizens and voters, on an equality with yourselves? Never. No. If you desire Negro citizenship, if you desire to allow them to come into the state and settle with the white man, if you desire them to vote on an equality with yourselves, and to make them eligible to office, to serve on juries, and to adjudge your rights, then support Mr. Lincoln and the Black Republican Party, who are in favor of the citizenship of the Negro. Never, never. For one, I am opposed to Negro citizenship in any and every form. Cheers, I believe this government was made on the white basis. Good. I believe it was made by white men for the benefit of white men and their posterity forever, and I am in favor of confining citizenship to white men, men of European birth and descent, instead of conferring it upon Negroes, Indians, and other inferior races. Good for you. Douglas forever. Mr. Lincoln, following the example and lead of all the little abolition orators, who go around and lecture in the basements of schools and churches, reads from the Declaration of Independence, that all men were created equal, and then asks, how can you deprive a Negro of that equality which God and the Declaration of Independence awards to him? Now, I hold that Illinois had a right to abolish and prohibit slavery as she did, and I hold that Kentucky has the same right to continue and protect slavery that Illinois had to abolish it. I hold that New York had as much right to abolish slavery as Virginia has to continue it, and that each and every state of this union is a sovereign power, with the right to do as it pleases upon this question of slavery, and upon all its domestic institutions. And why can we not adhere to the great principle of self-government, upon which our institutions were originally based? We can. 
I believe that this new doctrine preached by Mr. Lincoln and his party will dissolve the Union if it succeeds. They are trying to array all the northern states in one body against the South, to excite a sectional war between the free states and the slave states, in order that the one or the other may be driven to the wall. Douglas also charged Lincoln with opposing the Dred Scott decision because, "...it deprives the Negro of the rights and privileges of citizenship." Lincoln responded that, "...the next Dred Scott decision," could allow slavery to spread into free states. Douglas accused Lincoln of wanting to overthrow state laws that excluded blacks from states such as Illinois, which were popular with the Northern Democrats. Lincoln did not argue for complete social equality. However, he did say Douglas ignored the basic humanity of blacks, and that slaves did have an equal right to liberty. As Lincoln said, I agree with Judge Douglas he is not my equal in many respects, certainly not in color, perhaps not in moral or intellectual endowment. But in the right to eat the bread, without the leave of anybody else, which his own hand earns, he is my equal and the equal of Judge Douglas, and the equal of every living man. As Lincoln said, This declared indifference, but, as I must think, covert real zeal for the spread of slavery, I cannot but hate. I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. I hate it because it deprives our Republican example of its just influence in the world enables the enemies of free institutions, with plausibility, to taunt us as hypocrites, causes the real friends of freedom to doubt our sincerity, and especially because it forces so many really good men amongst ourselves into an open war with the very fundamental principles of civil liberty, criticizing the Declaration of Independence, and insisting that there is no right principle of action but self-interest. Lincoln said he himself did not know how emancipation should happen. He believed in colonization, but admitted that this was impractical. Without colonization he said that it would be wrong for emancipated slaves to be treated as underlings, but that there was a large opposition to social and political equality, and that a universal feeling, whether well or ill-founded, cannot be safely disregarded. Lincoln said that Douglas's public indifference to slavery would result in the expansion of slavery because it would mold public sentiment to accept slavery. As Lincoln said, Public sentiment is everything. With public sentiment, nothing can fail, without it nothing can succeed. Consequently he who molds public sentiment, goes deeper than he who enacts statutes or pronounces decisions. He makes statutes and decisions possible or impossible to be executed. Lincoln said Douglas, cares not whether slavery is voted down or voted up, and that, in the words of Henry Clay, he would, blow out the moral lights around us and eradicate the love of liberty. At the debate at Freeport Lincoln forced Douglas to choose between two options, either of which would damage Douglas's popularity and chances of getting re-elected. Lincoln asked Douglas to reconcile popular sovereignty with the Supreme Court's Dred Scott decision. Douglas responded that the people of a territory could keep slavery out even though the Supreme Court said that the federal government had no authority to exclude slavery, simply by refusing to pass a slave code and other legislation needed to protect slavery. Douglas alienated Southerners with this Freeport Doctrine, which damaged his chances of winning the presidency in 1860. As a result, Southern politicians would use their demand for a slave code for territories such as Kansas to drive a wedge between the northern and southern wings of the Democratic Party. In splitting what was the majority political party in 1858 the Democratic Party, Southerners guaranteed the election of Lincoln, the nominee of the newly formed Republican Party, in 1860. Douglas's efforts to gain support in all sections of the country through popular sovereignty failed. By allowing slavery where the majority wanted it, he lost the support of Republicans led by Lincoln who thought Douglas was unprincipled. By defeating a pro-slavery Lecompton Constitution and advocating a Freeport Doctrine to stop slavery in Kansas where the majority were anti-slavery, he lost the support of the South. Before the debate at Charleston, Democrats held up a banner that read, Negro Equality, with a picture of a white man, a Negro woman and a mulatto child. At this debate Lincoln went further than before in denying the charge that he was an abolitionist, saying that I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races, that I am not nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people, and I will say in addition to this that there is a physical difference between the white and black races which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. 
and inasmuch as they cannot so live, while they do remain together there must be the position of superior and inferior, and I as much as any other man am in favour of having the superior position assigned to the white race. I say upon this occasion I do not perceive that because the white man is to have the superior position the Negro should be denied everything. I do not understand that because I do not want a Negro woman for a slave I must necessarily want her for a wife. My understanding is that I can just let her alone. While denying abolitionist tendencies was effective politics, the African-American abolitionist Frederick Douglass remarked on Lincoln's entire freedom from popular prejudice against the colored race. In spite of Lincoln's denial of abolitionist tendencies, Stephen Douglas charged Lincoln with having an ally in Frederick Douglass in preaching abolition doctrines. Stephen Douglas said that the Negro Frederick Douglass told all the friends of Negro equality and Negro citizenship to rally as one man around Abraham Lincoln. Stephen Douglas also charged Lincoln with a lack of consistency when speaking on the issue of racial equality, and cited Lincoln's previous statements that the declaration that all men are created equal applies to blacks as well as whites. Lincoln said that slavery expansion endangered the Union, and mentioned the controversies caused by it in Missouri in 1820, in the territories conquered from Mexico that led to the Compromise of 1850, and again with the bleeding Kansas controversy over slavery. Lincoln said that the crisis would be reached and passed when slavery was put in the course of ultimate extinction. At Galesburg, Douglas sought again to prove that Lincoln was an abolitionist with the following quotations from Lincoln. I should like to know, if taking this old Declaration of Independence, which declares that all men are equal upon principle, and making exceptions to it, where will it stop? If one man says it does not mean a Negro, why may not another man say it does not mean another man? If that declaration is not the truth, let us get this statute book in which we find it and tear it out. Let us discard all this quibbling about this man and the other man. This race and that race and the other race being inferior, and therefore they must be placed in an inferior position, discarding our standard that we have left us. Let us discard all these things, and unite as one people throughout this land, until we shall once more stand up declaring that all men are created equal. At Alton, Lincoln tried to reconcile his statements on equality. He said that the authors of the Declaration of Independence intended to include all men, but they did not mean to declare all men equal in all respects. They did not mean to say all men were equal in color, size, intellect, moral development or social capacity. They defined with tolerable distinctness in what they did consider all men created equal, equal in certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They meant to set up a standard maxim for free society which should be familiar to all, constantly looked to, constantly labored for, and even, though never perfectly attained, constantly approximated, and thereby constantly spreading and deepening its influence and augmenting the happiness and value of life to all people, of all colors, everywhere. Lincoln contrasted his support for the Declaration with opposing statements made by the Southern politician John C. Calhoun and Senator John Pettit of Indiana, who called the Declaration a self-evident lie. Lincoln said that Chief Justice Roger Taney in his Dred Scott decision and Stephen Douglas were opposing Thomas Jefferson's self-evident truth, dehumanizing blacks and preparing the public mind to think of them as only property. Lincoln thought slavery had to be treated as a wrong, and kept from growing. As Lincoln said, That is the real issue. That is the issue that will continue in this country when these poor tongues of Judge Douglas and myself shall be silent. It is the eternal struggle between these two principles, right and wrong, throughout the world. They are the two principles that have stood face to face from the beginning of time, and will ever continue to struggle. The one is the common right of humanity and the other the divine right of kings. It is the same principle in whatever shape it develops itself. It is the same spirit that says, you work and toil and earn bread, and all eat it. No matter in what shape it comes, whether from the mouth of a king who seeks to bestride the people of his own nation and live by the fruit of their labor, or from one race of men as an apology for enslaving another race, it is the same tyrannical principle. Lincoln used a number of colorful phrases in the debates, such as when he said that one argument by Douglas made a horse chestnut into a chestnut horse, and compared an evasion by Douglas to the sepia cloud from a cuttlefish. Lincoln said that Douglas's Freeport doctrine was a do-nothing sovereignty that was as thin as the homeopathic soup that was made by boiling the shadow of a pigeon that had starved to death.
Topic: Results. The October surprise of the election was the endorsement of the Democrat Douglas by former Whig John J. Crittenden. Non-Republican former Whigs comprised the biggest bloc of swing voters, and Crittenden's endorsement of Douglas rather than Lincoln, also a former Whig, reduced Lincoln's chances of winning. On election day, as the districts were drawn to favor Douglas's party, the Democrats won 40 seats in the state House of Representatives, and the Republicans won 35. In the state Senate, Republicans held 11 seats, and Democrats held 14. Stephen A. Douglas was re-elected by the legislature, 54-46, even though Lincoln's Republicans won the popular vote with a percentage of 50.6%, or by 3,402 votes. However, the widespread media coverage of the debates greatly raised Lincoln's national profile, making him a viable candidate for nomination as the Republican candidate in the upcoming 1860 presidential election. He would go on to secure both the nomination and the presidency, beating Douglas as the Northern Democratic candidate, among others, in the process. Lincoln also went on to be in contact with editors looking to publish the debate texts. George Parsons, the Ohio Republican Committee chairman, got Lincoln in touch with Ohio's main political publisher, Follett and Foster, of Columbus. They published copies of the text, and titled the book, Political Debates Between Hun. Abraham Lincoln and Hun. Stephen A. Douglas in the celebrated campaign of 1858, in Illinois. Four printings were made, and the fourth sold 16,000 copies. The Lincoln Douglas debate format that is used in high school and college competition today is named after this series of debates. Modern presidential debates trace their roots to the Lincoln Douglas debates, though the format today is remarkably different from the original. Commemoration In 1994, C SPAN aired a series of reenactments of the debates, filmed on location. The locations for the debates in Illinois have established memorials featuring plaques and statuary of Douglas and Lincoln. The 1940 film Abe Lincoln in Illinois includes an invented version of the debate. Notes Further reading On January 1, 2009, BBC Audiobooks America, published the first complete recording of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, starring actors David Strathairn as Abraham Lincoln and Richard Dreyfus as Stephen Douglas with an introduction by Alan C. Gelzo, Henry R. Luce III Professor of the Civil War Era at Gettysburg College. The text of the recording was provided courtesy of the Abraham Lincoln Association as presented in the collected works of Abraham Lincoln. Jaffa, Harry V. 2009. Crisis of the House Divided, An Interpretation of the Issues in the Lincoln-Douglas Debates, 50th Anniversary Edition. University of Chicago Press. ISBN 978-0-226-39118-2. Good, Timothy S. 2007. The Lincoln-Douglas Debates and the Making of a President. McFarland Press. ISBN 978-0-7864-3065-9. External links Website of the Stephen A. Douglas Association Original Manuscripts and Primary Sources, Lincoln-Douglas Debates, 1st edition 1860 Chappelle Manuscript Foundation Illinois Civil War, Debates Digital History, Archived Link Bartleby E-Text, Political Debates between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen A. Douglas The Lincoln-Douglas Debates of 1858 Mr. Lincoln and Freedom, Lincoln-Douglas Debates Abraham Lincoln, a resource guide from the Library of Congress Free audio book of "...noted speeches of Abraham Lincoln", including the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Booknotes interview with Harold Holzer on the Lincoln-Douglas debates, August 22, 1993. Lincoln-Douglas debate transcripts on the Internet Archive Conceptions of Race Central to Lincoln-Douglas debates, Pantograph Bloomington, Illinois Newspaper.